Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton. In this video, we're going to talk about Taylor and Maclaurin series. So in the previous video, we discussed how to find power series representations for certain types of functions, and they're related to geometric series. Now we're going to discuss power series representations for other types of functions. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to describe the procedure for finding a Taylor polynomial of a given order of a function. So which functions can be represented by power series, and how can we find those representations? We're going to start to answer these types of questions by supposing that f of x is any function that can be represented as a power series. So let's say f of x is this power series, where n equals 0 is the index, and it goes up to infinity. c sub n are the coefficients times x minus a in parentheses to the n exponent. So you can write this power series as an infinite polynomial, where the first term is c sub 0, the next term is c sub 1 times the quantity x subtract a, plus c sub 2 times the quantity x subtract a squared, plus c sub 3 times x minus a cubed, and so on. We're going to see that the coefficient c sub n must be in terms of the function f of x. So if you change the function f of x, then the coefficients will also change. So notice if we let x equal a, then all the terms after the first term are 0. And we get that if you substitute a into the function, f of a will be the first term c sub 0, because all the other terms will be 0. In addition, if you're within the interval convergence, capital R grain 0, you can find the derivatives of all orders using term-by-term -term differentiation and then evaluate each of the derivatives at the value x equals a. This method is actually going to determine a pattern for each of the coefficients c sub n in the above power series for the function f of x. So let's start with the function f of x. Let's write it as an infinite polynomial, c sub 0 plus c sub 1 times the quantity x minus a plus c sub 2 times x minus a all squared, and so on. If you take the derivative, then this is what you'll have. You'll have f prime of x is equal to, the derivative of c sub 0 is 0, because c sub 0 is just a constant, and then the derivative of c sub 1 times x is c sub 1, and the derivative of c sub 1 times a is 0, because that will just be a constant. Then the next term, the derivative can be found by using the power rule. Take 2 as a coefficient, so you have 2 times c sub 2, times x subtract a to the first power after you use the power rule, and then times the derivative of the inside function, the derivative of the inside function will be 1. And so it will be 2 times c sub 2 times the quantity x subtract a for your second term for the derivative of f prime of x. And then the third term will be 3 times c sub 3 times x minus a to the second power times 1 because that's the derivative of the inside function. And so you have 3 times c sub 3 times the quantity x minus a all to the second power. If you continue this pattern, you'll have 4 times c sub 4 times x minus a all cubed, and so on. And so it looks like if you take the function and evaluate at the value x equals a, then f prime of a will be c sub 1, will stay c sub 1. The second term, you'll have 0 because you have 2 times c sub 2 times 0 after x equals a. The third term will be 3 times c sub 3 times, again, 0 because x equals a and then so on. If you let x equals a, all the terms after that will be 0, and so it looks like f prime of a is just the first term, c sub 1. Now let's find the second derivative of f of x. So f double prime of x is equal to, if you take the derivative of c sub 1, that's 0. And then the derivative of the next term, the derivative of the next term would be derivative of 2 times c sub 2 times x minus a. The derivative of this term would be 2 times c sub 2 times x, that derivative is 2 times c sub 2, and then 2 times c sub 2 times a, the derivative of that term would just be 0 because that's just the constant. So you have 2 times c sub 2 plus, and the next term would be 3 times, using the power rule, you take the power to the front and multiply by the 3, and also by the c sub 3, you have 3 times 2 times c sub 3 times x minus a to the first power times the derivative of the inside function, again, is 1. And so it will be 3 times 2 times c sub 3 times x minus a in parentheses. The derivative of the next term would be 4 times c sub 4 times, take 3 to the front and make it a coefficient, so you have 4 times 3 times c sub 4 times x minus a in parentheses to the second power after you use the power rule. And then the derivative of the next term, if you use the same pattern, it'll be 5 times 4 times c sub 5 times the quantity x minus a all to the third power using the power rule. However, if we evaluate the second derivative at x equals a, notice that all the terms will be 0 except for just 2 times c sub 2 because x minus a will be a minus a and they're all 0. And so f double prime of a will be 2 times c sub 2. So, so far we have f prime of a was c sub 1 and f double prime of a is equal to 2 times c sub 2. Now let's take one more derivative and I think we'll be able to find out the pattern. f triple prime of x is equal to, well the derivative of 2 times c sub 2, that's now a constant, the derivative is 0. The derivative of the next term will be 3 times 2 times c sub 3 times x. The derivative of that term would be 3 times 2 times c sub 3 because the derivative of x is just 1. And then the derivative of the second term would be 3 times 2 times c sub 3 times a. That's just a constant, so the derivative is 0. So you'll have 3 times 2 times c sub 3 for your first term of f triple prime of x. The derivative of the next term would be 4 times 3 times c sub 4 times the derivative of x minus a all to the second 
You take the 2 to the front using power rule. So you have 4 times 3 times 2 times c sub 4 times x minus a to the first power times the derivative of the inside function, again, is 1. And so the derivative would be 4 times 3 times 2 times c sub 4 times the quantity x minus a to the first power. Plus, the derivative of the next term would be 5 times 4 times c sub 5 times the derivative of x minus a cubed. Well, you take the power to the front, again, so you have 5 times 4 times 3 times c sub 5 times x minus a to the second power times the derivative of the inside function, which again would be 1. And so it looks like f triple prime of x would be 3 times 2 times c sub 3 plus 4 times 3 times 2 times c sub 4 times the quantity x minus a plus 5 times 4 times 3 times c sub 5 times x minus a in parentheses all squared and then so on. You have an infinite number of terms again. However, if you evaluate the third derivative at the value x equals a, all the terms that have x minus a to a power will just disappear because that's going to be 0. And then you'll have 3 times 2 times c sub 3 is the only term that does not have x minus a involved. And so f triple prime of a will simplify to be 3 times 2 times c sub 3, which we know that 3 times 2 is actually 3 times 2 times 1, and that is actually rewritten as 3 factorial. So it looks like the third derivative at a is 3 factorial times c sub 3. If this pattern continues, let's find out the value of the nth derivative of f evaluated at x equals a. It looks like the first derivative was 1 factorial times c sub 1. The second derivative was 2 factorial times c sub 2. The third derivative is 3 factorial times c sub 3. It looks like the nth derivative of f evaluated at x equals a will be n factorial times c sub whatever the derivative was. So third derivative was c sub 3, second derivative was c sub 2, first derivative was c sub 1. So it looks like it'll be n factorial times c sub n. And so if you can get c sub n by itself, divide both sides of the equation by n factorial, c sub n is equal to the nth derivative of f evaluated at x equals a divided by n factorial. These are the coefficients of the power series that we were talking about earlier. The function f of x determines the power series coefficients and the coefficients are derivatives, evaluated at x equals a, and then you divide by n factorial. And so this is what's called a Taylor series. So the definition for a Taylor series of a function, let f of x be a function with derivatives of all orders. You can find the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on for the function f of x throughout some interval containing x equals a as an interior point. So x equals a is some value inside the interval. Then the Taylor series of the function f at x equals a is the power series n equals zero to infinity c sub n times the quantity x minus a all to the n power is equal to the power series but well, we found out a formula for the coefficient c sub n. It's the nth derivative of the function evaluated at x equals a divided by n factorial, and then x minus a to the n power will just stay the same. And this power series will converge as long as the distance between x and a is less than the radius of convergence, capital R. So in other words, the coefficients of the power series for f of x centered at x equals a are c sub n is equal to the nth derivative of f evaluated at x equals a all divided by n factorial for n greater than equal to zero. And keep in mind that the definition of 0 factorial was equal to 1. Therefore, you can actually write a power series representation for f of x at x equals a as follows. f of x is equal to f of a, that is the 0 derivative of f, so it's just the function itself, evaluated at x equals a, divided by 0 factorial, which is equal to 1, so it's just f of a, plus f prime of a, so it's the first derivative of f, evaluated at x equals a, divided by 1 factorial, times x minus a to the first power, plus f double prime of f, evaluated at x equals a, so this is the second derivative of f, evaluated at x equals a, divided by 2 factorial, times x minus a to the second power, plus the third derivative of f, evaluated at x equals a, divided by 3 factorial, times x minus a cubed, and then so on. It's actually an infinite polynomial. And then notice, in the special case where the value a is equal to 0, then the Taylor series becomes as follows. f of x is equal to the Taylor series, or the series, n equals 0 to infinity, the nth derivative of f evaluated at 0, because the a is equal to 0, divided by n factorial, times x minus a to the n would be x to the n, and then this is equal to f of 0 plus f prime of 0 divided by 1 factorial times x to the first power plus f double prime evaluated at 0 divided by 2 factorial times x minus 0 squared plus the third derivative of f evaluated at 0 divided by 3 factorial times x cubed and so on. This series where a is equal to 0 actually arises frequently enough that it actually is given a name and this is called a Maclaurin series where the value of a is equal to 0. So let's look at an example. Example 1, Taylor and Maclaurin series. Assume that each of the following functions has a power series representation about the given point x equals a. Find the Taylor or Maclaurin series 
about x equals a and specify the radius of convergence for the power series. So number one, we're going to find out a Taylor series, or in this case, a Maclaurin series, because a equals zero, for the function f of x equals e to the x. So the natural exponential function. So let's find out what is the pattern for the coefficient c sub n, because those are involving derivatives of the function evaluated at the value x equals a, or in this case, x equals zero. So we need the original function. The original function is for f of x is equal to e to the x. If you evaluate the function at the value a equals zero, then you'll have f of zero, and that will give you e to the zero, which is equal to one. So f of a is equal to one. That's your first term of the Maclaurin series. The first derivative of the function would be f prime of x, the derivative of e to the x is itself e to the x, and if you evaluate the derivative at the value a equals zero, then f prime of zero will also be e to the zero, which is equal to one. The second derivative of the function is the derivative of e to the x is still e to the x, and so the second derivative evaluated at a, which is in this case a zero, the second derivative at zero would be e to the zero, which is one. And so you find out a pattern for all the coefficients c sub n for your Maclaurin series. Therefore, all the derivatives of your function are going to be e to the x, which means that if you evaluate all the derivatives at a equals zero, all the derivatives evaluated at zero will give you e to the zero, which is equal to one, for all values of n. So that means we can write the function as a Maclaurin series as follows. The series is starting at n equals zero up to infinity. The nth derivative of the function evaluated at a divided by n factorial times the quantity x subtract a to the n. That's the definition of a Taylor series. However, since we have a equals zero, then we actually have a Maclaurin series. It's the series n equals zero to infinity, the nth derivative evaluated at zero divided by n factorial, that's the coefficient c sub n, times x minus a to the n becomes x to the n because a was equal to zero. And so this is a Maclaurin series. Well, we found out all the coefficients, the nth derivative of the function evaluate zero are always gonna be one. And so you'll have one divided by n factorial times x to the n and the series will be n equals zero to infinity. And so you can rewrite this. It'll be series n equals zero to infinity of x to the n divided by n factorial. That is the power series, or in this case, it's called a Maclaurin series because a equals zero for the function f of x, which is equal to e to the x. And so now that we have the Maclaurin series, let's find out what is the radius of convergence. Well, we can find out the radius of convergence using the ratio test. So the ratio test said the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n is actually equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of, well, the n plus first term of this power series would be x to the n plus one divided by n plus one in parentheses factorial. And then if you divide by a sub n, that's multiplied by the reciprocal of your nth term, multiply by n factorial divided by x to the n. And if we simplify what's inside the absolute value, we would have limit as n goes to infinity of x divided by n plus one. And as n goes to infinity, keep in mind the absolute value of x is just a fixed value. And so you have absolute value of x that can be taken outside the limit times the limit as n goes to infinity of one divided by n plus one. And you can drop the absolute value on the n plus one because it's positive, which is equal to absolute value of x times this limit of one divided by n plus one as n goes to infinity is zero. So you have absolute value of x times zero, which will give you zero. So in other words, since the limit is zero and it's less than one for all values of x, that means that the radius of convergence is infinity. In other words, this is the power series for e to the x for all values of x. It doesn't matter what the x value is, this power series will always converge to the function f of x, which in this case was e to the x. So this is a power series representation for e to the x where the center of the power series is a equals zero. So let's try another problem. Number two, the function g of x is equal to sine of x, and it's also centered at a equals zero this time. So we're gonna to try to find what is the power series representation or Maclaurin series representation for the function sine of x. So we need to find out what is the pattern for the coefficient c sub n. G of x was the original function sine of x. If you evaluate the original function at the value a equals zero, sine of zero gives you zero. So g of zero is zero. The first derivative, g prime of x, the derivative of the sine function is cosine of x. Evaluate zero would be cosine of zero, which would be equal to one. The second derivative of the function is equal to negative sine of x. That's the derivative of cosine of x. And so if you evaluate the second derivative, negative sine of x at the value a equals zero, you'll find out that it's negative sine of zero, which is equal to zero. So the second derivative evaluated at zero is also zero. The third derivative of the function is negative cosine of x because that's the derivative of negative sine of x, the previous derivative. And if you evaluate the third derivative at the value a equals zero, the third derivative of zero will be negative cosine of zero, which would be negative one. So the third derivative evaluated at zero is equal to negative one. The fourth derivative of the function would be the derivative of negative cosine of x. 
That's sine of x. And so the fourth derivative is sine of x. And if you evaluate the fourth derivative at the value a equals zero, the fourth derivative at zero would be sine of zero again, and that's zero. So notice that the derivatives repeat in cycles of four, and so we can actually write them in a Clorin series now. G of x is equal to g of zero plus g prime of zero divided by one factorial times x minus zero to the first power, so that's just x to the first power, plus the second derivative evaluate at zero divided by two factorial times x minus zero squared, or just x squared, plus the third derivative evaluate zero divided by three factorial times x cubed, and so on. Well, notice that g of zero was zero. g double prime of zero was zero. The fourth derivative of g at zero was also zero. So it looks like g of zero is zero, g double prime of zero is zero, so this term entirely cancels out. The fourth derivative of g at zero was also zero, so this term also cancels out. It looks like you are canceling out all the even powers of x if this pattern continues. So the only terms that are left over will be one divided by one factorial x, is just, just x, it's one x, and then you also have negative one times x cubed, so that's negative x cubed, divided by three factorial. The next term that will survive will be the x to the fifth term, so that'll be plus x to the fifth divided by five factorial, and then the next term after that will be negative x to the seventh divided by seven factorial, and so on. So this is what the function g of x will actually be representing using a power series. It'll be g of x is equal to the power series n equals zero to infinity, the nth derivative of g evaluated at a divided by n factorial times the quantity x minus a all to the n. That's the Taylor series representation for g of x. And we know that the coefficients are actually going to be alternating signs. It goes from positive one to negative one, positive one to negative one, and so on. So the series will be n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n, so that way the first term is positive, the next term after that will be negative, and so on. But notice on the powers of x, you only have the odd powers of x. Well, if you want to write odd powers, it'll be x to the 2n plus one. That way if n equals zero, the first power of x that survives will be x to the first power. If n equals one, then you'll actually have x to the third power. And notice also in the denominator, that the power of the x is also the number of factorial you have in the denominator. So if the power on the x is going to be 2n plus 1, the denominator will be 2n plus 1 in parentheses factorial. So the function sine of x can be represented as a power series representation or Maclaurin series as n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, because the alternating signs from term to term, times x to the 2n plus 1, because only the powers that survive are the odd powers of x, divided by 2n plus 1 in parentheses factorial. So now let's find out what is the radius of convergence for this power series for the function sine of x, where it's centered at a equals 0. So let's find out the radius of convergence using, again, the ratio test. So the ratio test, limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term is equal to the value L, and we're going to find out what is L. So the limit will be n goes to infinity of the absolute value, the n plus first term would be of the power series, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times x, now replace the n with an n plus 1, so you have x to the 2 in times in parentheses, n plus 1, and then plus 1 outside the parentheses, divided by the denominator, do the same thing, replace the n with an n plus 1 in parentheses, so you have 2 times in parentheses, n plus 1, and then outside the parentheses, plus 1, and it's still factorial, times the reciprocal of your nth term, which would be n plus 1 factorial in the numerator, negative 1 to the n in the denominator, and x to the 2n plus 1 power also in the denominator. Now we need to simplify what's inside the absolute value so we can find out the limit. So you have the limit as n goes to infinity of the quantity, negative 1 to the n plus 1, that's negative 1 times negative 1 to the n, and then you have x to the 2n plus 3 after you simplify the exponent, so x to the 2n plus 3, and then you have 2n plus 1 in parentheses factorial. The denominator becomes 2n plus 3 factorial, and then you have negative 1 to the n, and you have an x to the 2n plus 1. So the negative 1 to the n's will cancel out, and so now you have the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value. You have a negative 1 left over in the numerator. The x to the 2n plus 3 is really x to the 2n times x cubed, and the denominator has x to the 2n, and then it's also times x, because you have 2n plus 1 as the exponent. So it looks like you'll have an x squared left over after you cancel out the x cubed divided by x, and you also cancel out the x to the 2n from the numerator and denominator. And then the factorials, 2n plus 1 factorial is in the numerator, and 2n plus 3 factorial is in the denominator. Well, 2n plus 3 factorial is 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 1 in parentheses factorial. So the 2n plus 1's factorial will cancel out, and you'll have a 2n plus 3 left over in the denominator. So let's find out what is the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of negative 1 times x squared all over 2n plus 3. Well, the absolute value of negative 1 is just positive 1, so it just goes away. But then you have the absolute value of x squared 
you can take that outside the limit. So absolute value of x squared times the limit of one divided by two n plus three. You can drop the absolute value on the two n plus three because it's positive. And so you have absolute value of x squared times the limit of one divided by two n plus three. This limit is zero because this n goes to infinity, one divided by two n plus three will approach zero. So you have the absolute value of x squared times zero, which again will be zero. So since the limit is less than one, it's zero. That means by the ratio test, the power series will always converge for all values of x. And so the radius of convergence is again infinity. So that means that the power series or Maclaurin series, series n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n, x to the two n plus one divided by two n plus one factorial. This is the power series representation for the sine function and it always converges for any value of x. So number three, let's find a power series representation for the function cosine of x. So h of x is cosine of x in this case, and we'll have the power series centered at a equals zero again. So this time we're gonna find out a pattern for cosine of x using the derivatives evaluated at zero. So h of x, the original function is cosine of x. If you evaluate the original function at zero, cosine of zero is one. If you take the derivative of the function h of x, the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. If you evaluate the derivative at zero, negative sine of zero will give you zero. The second derivative of the function, the derivative of negative sine of x will give you negative cosine of x. So that's the second derivative of h of x. And if you evaluate the second derivative at zero, you'll get negative cosine of zero, that's equal to negative one. The third derivative of the function would be h triple prime of x. It's the derivative of negative cosine of x. That's positive sine of x. The third derivative is sine of x. And if you evaluate the third derivative at zero, sine of zero is equal to zero. And then the fourth derivative of h of x is the derivative of sine of x, that's cosine of x. And if you evaluate cosine of x at zero, the fourth derivative at zero would be cosine of zero, which would be equal to one. So it looks like, just like the sine function, the derivatives repeat in cycles of four, so we can write the Maclaurin series for the function cosine of x as follows. h of x is equal to h of zero plus the first derivative at zero divided by one factorial times x to the first power plus the second derivative of the function h evaluate at zero divided by two factorial times x squared plus the third derivative of h evaluate zero divided by three factorial times x cubed and so on as an infinite polynomial. So that means if you actually write out what are the coefficients using the derivatives of the function h of x, and if you evaluate at zero, will be as follows. h of x is equal to h of zero was equal to one because cosine of zero is one, plus the first derivative evaluate zero divided by one factorial. Well, the first derivative at zero would be negative sine of zero at zero. So this term will just be zero because it's multiplied by zero. Then the next term would be h double prime evaluate at zero, that's negative one divided by two factorial. So it would be negative one divided by two factorial times x squared, plus the third derivative evaluate at zero was zero because that's sine of zero was zero. So you have zero divided by three factorial times x cubed, that's just zero again. Plus the next term would be the fourth derivative of the function of h, evaluate at zero, divided by four factorial. Well, the fourth derivative evaluate at zero was cosine of zero, which was one. So it'd be one divided by four factorial times x to the fourth. So it looks like the only terms that survive after plugging in a equals zero is the first term, you get one. The third term, you'll get negative x squared divided by two factorial. The fifth term, you'll have one over four factorial times x to the fourth, or x to the fourth divided by four factorial. The next term that will survive after this will be negative x to the sixth divided by six factorial, and so on. So it looks like the Taylor series for this function h of x, which in this case will be this form, series n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative of your function h, evaluated at the value x equals a, divided by n factorial, times the quantity x minus a in parentheses to the n. So this is the Taylor series, but since the a is equal to zero, we actually have a Maclaurin series. It'll be the series n equals zero to infinity. Notice that the series alternates signs from one term to the next, so we'll need a negative one to the n, and notice that the first term is positive, so that if n equals zero, you'll have negative one to the zero, which is positive one times the powers of x that survive are the even powers of x. So we can write even powers as x to the two n and notice if n equals zero, the first power will be x to the zero, which is one. So that's the first term will be x to the zero, which is one. And then it's divided by, notice that the powers that survive on the x's are actually the same number factorial in the denominator of that term. So it'll be x to the two n divided by, and the denominator is parentheses around the two n factorial. This is a Maclaurin series for the function h of x equals cosine of x, where the power series is centered at a equals zero. It's called a Maclaurin series. So now let's find out what are the x values where this power series or Maclaurin series will actually converge to the function cosine of x. So we're gonna find out what is the radius of convergence. So again, we're gonna use a ratio test. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by a sub n, which is the nth term. And we'll find out what is this value, so we'll call it l. So it's the limit as n goes to infinity of the n plus first term would be negative one to the n plus one times x to the two and replace the n with an n plus one in parentheses. So it'll be x to the two times n plus one in parentheses divided by, do the same thing in the denominator, it'll be two times the quantity n plus one and then all that 
factorial. Divided by the nth term, which would be times the reciprocal of your nth term would be 2n factorial in the numerator, negative 1 to the n in the denominator, and x to the 2n also in the denominator. Now we need to simplify what's inside the absolute value to find out the radius convergence. You have the limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value, negative 1 to the n plus 1 becomes negative 1 times negative 1 to the n times x to the 2 times n plus 1 in parentheses becomes x to the 2n plus 2, and then you also have a 2n factorial in the numerator. The denominator becomes 2n plus 2 factorial times negative 1 to the n times x to the 2n. Now to simplify, you need to find out what will actually cancel out. You have a negative 1 to the n in the numerator, and you also have a negative 1 to the n in the denominator, so those will cancel out. You also have x to the 2n plus 2 exponent, so that's really x to the 2n times x squared. So the x to the 2n's will cancel out, and you have an x squared left over in the numerator. So you have negative 1 and an x squared in the numerator, and then you have 2n factorial and a 2n plus 2 factorial in the denominator. The denominator, 2n plus 2 factorial, is really 2n plus 2 times 2n factorial. So the 2n factorials will cancel out and you have a 2n plus 2 left over in the denominator. And so just like the last problem, if you want to find out the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of negative 1 x squared divided by 2n plus 2, the absolute value of negative 1 will just be 1, so that just goes away. But then you have to take the absolute value of x squared and that can be taken outside the limit because the limit only depends on n. And then you'll find out the absolute value of x squared times the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 divided by 2n plus 2. Well, this limit is 0. So you have the absolute value of x squared times 0, which is equal to 0. So that means that for all values of x, the limit is equal to 0, and in the ratio test, if the limit is less than 1, that means that the series will actually converge. So this means that this Maclaurin series, or power series representation for the function cosine of x, will actually converge for all values of x. And so the radius of convergence is infinity again. So this power series, n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times x to the 2n power divided by 2n factorial is actually the cosine function for all values of x, because the radius of convergence is infinity. So let's try a couple more. Number four, you have the function k of x is equal to natural log of x, but this time the value is a equals one. So it's not going to be a Maclaurin series this time, it's just gonna be a Taylor series because the power series is centered at a equals one. So start off the original function, k of x is equal to natural log of x. If you evaluate at the value a equals one, you have natural log of one, which is equal to zero. If you take the derivative of the function k of x, k prime of x is equal to 1 divided by x. That's the derivative of the natural log of x. And if you evaluate the derivative at the value a equals 1, you'll have 1 divided by 1, which is equal to 1. The second derivative of the function would be negative 1 divided by x squared using the power rule. Take the x to the numerator, make it x to the negative 1, and use the power rule. You'll have negative 1 divided by x squared. That's the second derivative of k of x. And if you evaluate the second derivative at the value a equals 1, you'll have negative 1 divided by 1 squared, that's equal to negative 1 after you simplify. The third derivative of the function k of x is equal to, again, use the power rule, take the x squared to the numerator to make it x to the negative 2, so you have negative 1, x to the negative 2, and if you take the derivative using the power rule, you'll have 2 divided by x cubed after you simplify. So this is the third derivative of k of x. If you evaluate the third derivative at the value a equals 1, you'll have 2 divided by 1 cubed, which is equal to 2. And then the fourth derivative of the function k of x is equal to, again, if you use the power rule, you'll get negative 6 divided by x to the fourth. If you evaluate the fourth derivative at a equals 1, you'll have negative 6 divided by 1 to the fourth, which is equal to negative 6. So we're trying to find out what is the pattern for these coefficients. And we know the coefficients are actually going to involve derivatives of the function k of x evaluated at the value a equals 1. So our power series representation or Taylor series representation will be this. k of x is equal to k of 1 because it's k of a plus k prime of 1 divided by 1 factorial times x minus a. Well, a is 1, so it'll be x minus 1 to the first power plus the second derivative of k evaluated at 1 divided by 2 factorial times x minus 1 squared, plus the third derivative evaluated at 1, divided by 3 factorial, times x minus 1 in parentheses, cubed, and then so on, as an infinite polynomial. So now we actually found out what are the coefficients for k prime of 1, k double prime of 1, k triple prime of 1, and so on. So k of x is equal to k of 1 was 0, so we can just ignore the first term. k prime of 1 was equal to 1, so it'll be 1 times x minus 1, divided by 1 factorial, plus k double prime of 1 was equal to negative 1, so it'll be negative 1 times x minus 1 squared divided by 2 factorial plus k triple prime of 1 was equal to 2 times x minus 1 in parentheses to the third power divided by 3 factorial 
subtract because that next coefficient is negative 6, so we subtract 6 times x minus 1 to the 4th divided by 4 factorial. So now notice the pattern that we actually have found. The first number was 1, that's really 0 factorial. So it's 0 factorial divided by 1 factorial times x minus 1 to the first power minus 1 is really 1 factorial, so 1 factorial divided by 2 factorial times x minus 1 squared plus 2 is actually 2 factorial, so 2 factorial divided by 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed, then subtract you have 6, that's really 3 factorial, times x minus 1 to the 4th, divided by 4 factorial. So this is what we actually found out. We have k of x is equal to this power series representation, or this Taylor series representation. It's series n equals 0 to infinity. The nth derivative of your function, so nth derivative of k, evaluate it at the value a equals 1, divided by n factorial, times x minus a, so it'll be x minus 1, all to the n, which is equal to power series n equals 0 to infinity. n minus 1 factorial is what we found out. It's looking like the numerator. You have n minus 1 1 factorial divided by n factorial because the denominators were n factorial already, so the numerator has to be n minus 1 factorial. It looks like the signs will alternate from positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. So it looks like we need negative 1 to the n because the series will alternate signs. And then we have x minus 1 to the n. And then if you simplify a little bit, remember that n factorial is really n times n minus 1 factorial. So the n minus 1 factorials will cancel out, and you have 1 over n left over. So it would be series n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n times negative 1 to the n times x minus 1 in parentheses to the n. And so you can simplify this as series n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n divided by n, and then you have x minus 1 to the n. So this is not called a Maclaurin series because a equals 1 in this case. Maclaurin series is only when a equals 0. So this is called a Taylor series for the function k of x, which was equal to natural log of x, where you have a is equal to 1. So this is a power series centered at a equals 1 for the function k of x equals natural log of x. So now we need to find out what are the values of x where this is the power series that actually will converge to the function natural log of x. So again, we're going to use the ratio test. Radius convergence is the limit as n goes to infinity using the ratio test. Absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. And we'll find out what is the value of L. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. The n plus first term would be negative 1 to the n plus 1 times x minus 1 in parentheses to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 times the reciprocal of your nth term, which would be n in the numerator, negative 1 to the n in the denominator, times x minus 1 to the power n, also in the denominator. And if you simplify what's inside the absolute value, you'll have limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value, you'll have a negative 1 times x minus 1 times n in the numerator, and the denominator will be an n plus 1, after you cancel out all the common factors in the numerator and denominator. So then you'll have absolute value of negative 1, that's just 1, so that just goes away again, but then you have to take the absolute value of x minus 1, and you can take that outside the limit, because it does not involve n, and so you have a limit as n goes to infinity of n divided by n plus 1, and again, you can drop the absolute value on the n and the n plus 1, because they're both positive. Positive. So you have the absolute value of x minus 1 times a limit as n goes to infinity of n divided by n plus 1. This limit is equal to 1 using La Hopital's rule. So you have absolute value of x minus 1 times 1, and that means that the absolute value of x minus 1 is the limit. So L is the absolute value of x minus 1. Well, we know by the ratio test, if the limit is less than 1, then the power series converges absolutely. So if the absolute value of x minus 1 is the limit, we need the absolute value of x minus 1 less than 1 for the power series or Taylor series to converge to the natural log of x. So our radius of convergence will be capital R is equal to 1. So let's try one more. Number 5, the function m of x is equal to 1 divided by x squared. And again, we're going to be centering the power series at a equals 1. So it's not going to be a Maclaurin series. It'll be a Taylor series. So the function m of x was 1 divided by x squared. If you evaluate the function m at a equals 1, you'll have 1 divided by 1 squared, which is equal to 1. The first derivative of m is negative 2 divided by x cubed using the power rule. And if you evaluate this derivative at a equals 1, you'll have negative 2 divided by 1 cubed, which is equal to negative 2. If you take the second derivative of the function m, you'll get 6 divided by x x to the fourth, and if you evaluate the second derivative at 1, you'll have 6 divided by 1 to the fourth, which will give you 6. If you take the third derivative of the function m, you actually have negative 24 divided by x to the fifth, which will be, if you evaluate at 1 for the third derivative, you'll have negative 24 divided by 1 to the fifth, which will be negative 24. So again, we're trying to find out a pattern for these coefficients. So let's write out the power series for the function m of x. m of x will be m of 1 plus m prime evaluated at 1 divided by 1 factorial times the quantity x minus 1 to the first power plus the second derivative of m evaluated at 1 divided by 2 factorial 
times the quantity x minus 1 all squared plus the third derivative of m evaluated at 1 divided by 3 factorial times x minus 1 all in parentheses cubed. So this is the power series representation or Taylor series representation for the function m of x where the function was 1 divided by x squared and it's centered at a equals 1. So now let's fill in all these coefficients for m of 1, m prime of 1, m double prime of 1, and so on. Well, m of 1 was 1, so the first term will just be 1. The next coefficient will be m prime of 1, that's negative 2. So we'll have negative 2 divided by 1 factorial times x minus 1. Plus, the second derivative evaluated at 1 was 6, so we have 6 divided by 2 factorial times x minus 1 all squared. Plus, the third derivative evaluated at 1 was negative 24, so we'll have negative 24 divided by 3 factorial times x minus 1 all cubed, and then so on. So it looks like the Taylor series representation for the function m of x, n equals 0 to infinity, the nth derivative of the function m of x, evaluated at the value a equals 1, divided by n factorial, times x minus a, so that'll be x minus 1, all to the n power, will actually be the series n equals 0 to infinity. It looks like the numerator is actually a factorial again. However, it will be one number larger factorial than the denominator. So you have one factorial, but the numerator is two factorial. 2 factorial in the denominator, but 6 is actually 3 factorial. 24 is actually 4 factorial. That's 1 larger than 3 factorial in the denominator. So it looks like the series is n equals 0 to infinity of n plus 1 factorial in the numerator divided by n factorial times, it looks like the series alternates signs again. It goes positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. So we need a negative 1 to the n to actually have the power series alternate signs times x minus 1 to the n power. And so again, if you simplify, n plus 1 factorial is really n plus 1 times n factorial. So n factorials will cancel out and you'll have an n plus 1 left over times negative 1 to the n times x minus 1 in parentheses to the n power. This is actually a Taylor series representation for the function m of x is equal to 1 divided by x squared where it's centered at the value a equals 1. So the last thing to do is actually find out what is the radius of convergence for this power series to converge to the function m of x which was 1 over x squared where it's centered at a equals 1. So again we're going to use the ratio test. The ratio test said find the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by by the nth term. So we're going to find out what is this limit so we can find out what are the values of x where this power series will actually converge. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. Replace all the n's with n plus 1 in your power series and you'll have negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 plus 1, so that'll be n plus 2, times x minus 1 to the n plus 1 in the numerator divided by your nth term, which would be negative 1 to the n times n plus 1 as it is times x minus 1 in parentheses to the nth power. And if you simplify what's inside the absolute value, this is what will be left over. You have a limit as n goes to infinity. You have a negative 1 left over from you canceling out negative 1 to the n in the numerator and denominator. And then you have n plus 2 divided by n plus 1. And the x minus 1 to the n plus 1 divided by x minus 1 to the n will just be x minus 1 in parentheses. So again, absolute value of negative 1 will just be 1. So that just goes away. But you have the absolute value of x minus 1 can be taken outside the limit because it does not involve n. So you have the limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value of x minus 1 times the fraction n plus 2 divided by n plus 1, and you can drop the absolute value on the n plus 2 and also n plus 1 because they're both positive. So you take the absolute value of x minus 1 outside the limit. So you have absolute value x minus 1 times the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 2 divided by n plus 1. This limit using La Hopital's rule is 1. So you have absolute value x minus 1 times 1, which will give you the absolute value x minus 1. So this is the limit. It's absolute value of x minus 1. We know by the ratio test that the series converges absolutely if the limit is actually less than 1. So if the absolute value x minus 1 is less than 1, then we actually have the power series representation will actually converge to the function m of x, which was 1 divided by x squared, where the power series is centered at a equals 1. And so that means our radius of convergence is 1. So this finishes our video on Taylor and Maclaurin series. We talked about a procedure for finding the Taylor polynomial of a given order for a function. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about Taylor's theorem with a remainder term.